Welcome, welcome, welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are around the globe. Welcome to season two, webinar 21 from the World Society of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus. This is your update in ophthalmology. This is your opportunity to talk to rock stars in ophthalmology, never gathered before together to update all of us on what's going on in ophthalmology, what's cool, what's new, and have an interactive discussion with you around the world. And today we expect people from around the world already. We have people from North America. We have people from Mexico, Ecuador, Colombia. We have people, for, I have to look to make sure I have it, from Chile, Argentina, Brazil, who are already on with us. We have people from all throughout Europe. Uh, the UK is here, France is here. Germany, Switzerland, uh, Ukraine, welcome, uh, Poland, Greece, uh, Spain, Portugal. We have Africa is here, Nigeria, Ghana, uh, South Africa is here. We have the Middle East, Lebanon, Israel, Saudi Arabia is here, China, India is here. In Asia, we have New Zealand, we have Hong Kong, Singapore, we have Australia, the world is here. So welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you for our upcoming webinars. Uh, June 19th, we have a, another wet lab, a more advanced wet lab. June 26th, we're gonna review ROP, which is around the world. July 3rd, we'll have infantile nystagmus syndrome. So uh, with all of that, we have webinars that are going on all over the, that you will be able to be a part of. We want you to join us. This is a participation event. So we want your questions to come in on Facebook. We need those questions to come in on YouTube. Type them in on the question and the comments section and we will get them passed along to us. Uh, one technical thing I'm gonna ask our technical people from NTOD to please mute themselves because we can hear them talking as they work. So Raul Jane and the people from NTOD, please mute yourself. Thank you very much. Our panelists will continue to answer as many possible questions online and live. And then the questions that are not answered here will be compiled in a PDF and uploaded onto the WSPOS website. Your questions will be answered. We also will have questions for you on menti.com. If you go to menti.com and enter the following numerical code, you will be able to see the questions that we have arranged for you. That code is 3809-8950. 3809-8950 is your passcode. And that will, you will see our questions for you. And we'll find out about where you're from and what you think about some of the things that are being said by our rock star panel. So with that, um, I'd like to get uh, to begin to introduce some of our uh, speakers today. We're going to introduce them once now so that we can delve into a discussion and not introduce them again. Honestly, this could take the entire 90 minutes, but we're going to make this short and we're going to make it to the point because the, the, the CVs for these people just go on at like hundreds of pages. So my co-moderator today is our co-director for the WSPOS. He is at the University of Pittsburgh uh, in Medical Center and the Children's Hospital there, but he is a, truly a man of the world from Kenya to England, to India, to, to the United States. His foot is in so many countries and he speaks so many languages. It's a pleasure to have you joined with Ken as my co-moderator. Uh, I, I don't even think I have to actually introduce Ike Ahmed. Um, I, I looked at your YouTube page, you have 14,000 subscribers, ophthalmologists from around the world who come to hear you talk about the most difficult cases that they ever deal with. And you are, uh, I mean, currently, I, I guess, would be considered one of the, the top ophthalmic surgeons in the world. He's won every award imaginable, every medal imaginable. People turn to him. For, uh, for expertise on how to deal with the most difficult and the most innovative approaches in ophthalmology. Uh, that picture of you sleeping must be the only time you actually sleep uh, for just even a few minutes. So uh, Ike Ahmed will be joining us today and we're thrilled to have him. Along with Ike, we have, uh, a, I mean, we have superstars in every subspecialty of ophthalmology. And our next superstar 
is Andy Lee. And if you don't know Andy Lee, then you're not involved in ophthalmology. Um, he is just an incredible teacher uh, he, he, with four, over 400 articles. Uh, he lectures everywhere imaginable. As he came on this morning, Andy said he had just finished a meeting in India. We're not surprised by that. Again, every award imaginable, a caring heart. He has taught so many of us around ophthalmology how not to kill people. And today he'll be talking to us about an incredibly cool topic mm -hmm. that I can't wait for you all to hear about. Whatever your role is in, in the world and in ophthalmology, you'll wanna hear this. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ken to do the rest of our introductions. David, thank you so much. I can't tell you how excited I am about this webinar. It's unbelievable. Before I introduce David, uh, I want to say that uh, we have people from Egypt, Sweden, Kuwait, Venezuela, Israel, Indonesia, Algeria. Um, I, it, just, it just goes on. The world is listening, and I'm not surprised. David Granite, uh, co-executive director and co-founder of WSPOS, father of three, husband of one, a tremendous personality and a force in pediatric ophthalmology. I'm so glad that uh, we met 20 years ago, David, or more. Uh, uh, it's been a pleasure working with you, it always is. I have to introduce um, some amazing people. And, you know, the ability to introduce Shiguru Kinoshita, who I do not say this lightly, is a hero of mine. Uh, he basically started years ago, 1970s, maybe 1980s, 1990s, the Oculus Surface program. You know, he was the one, uh, along with Toft, who looked at the centripetal movement of uh, epithelium. Uh, he's been instrumental in epithelial stem cell transplantation, instrumental in endothelial work. He is responsible with his group for the development of the Rho-associated protein kinase, a ROC inhibitor, topical application for partial endothelial dysfunction. He's had every award quite rightly. And as David said, we could go on and on. These are just snippets of what uh, Shigeru Kinoshita has um, has contributed to our profession, and I can't thank him enough for being here today. Um, it, it goes on. Namrata Sharma just nominated in the Power uh, Top 100 Women's uh, International uh, Ophthalmologist uh, list. Uh, she's at uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences. She's an absolute force and leader in cornea and ocular surface in Asia. Uh, together with Shiguru. She's had so many awards, uh, authored over 500 publications. Here she is in one of her international meetings outside the Kremlin and here with her, um, uh, with her family. Uh, again, Namrata, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I want to say a special thanks to Richard Packard, uh, because Richard Packard, uh, I would like to publicly acknowledge, taught me my surgical skill. Uh, Richard taught me to think about the eye while I was operating in three dimensions and to learn when I had to think about it in two dimensions. In 1979, he started phaco emulsification, and in that year, I inserted the first folded soft IOL during a rabbit, stu a rabbit uh, study. And then in 1999, he uh, actually used the first uh, Alcon Acrisoft IOL. Um, again, it, it, I could go on and on and talk about him. He's a, a, a wonderful fisherman, he tells me, but actually I know him as a great father, a great uh, husband, uh, wine connoisseur, as you can see, and uh, a, a great uh, uh, friend and colleague to people right around the world. And on that note, I'd <laughs> like to introduce Ike to um, share his, his talk with us. Thank you so much, David and Ken, um, and the uh, World Pediatric and Strabismus Society. It's great to be here. Uh, no question, the energy in the pediatric section is far greater than glaucoma. I mean, we're in a coma when we're in glaucoma, but I hope I won't put you in a coma here, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm very pleased to speak about something very dear to my heart, which is glaucoma surgery, particularly MIGS, and share some thoughts about where we are with MIGS and adult glaucoma and perhaps inspire some of you to continue to do this work in the pediatric population, which is needed. These are my disclosures, which I will state here. Many companies that I work with 
I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to pass through this pretty quickly because I have a short time to speak here. So we've seen a plethora of new devices and procedures develop in adult glaucoma. And these are designed to improve safety and efficacy in our traditional approaches, which of course, leave a lot to be wanted for. We all know, of course, pediatric eyes are not just small adult eyes and pediatric glaucomas are a very group of disorders, primary and secondary, that can be associated with comorbidity and it truly is one of the most challenging entities to treat. Unfortunately, as of yet, new glaucoma procedures have not yet been adequately investigated in these eyes. So I will share where we are with adult glaucoma and share some personal insights into our early experience with pediatric and childhood glaucoma. Of course, we know the principles of pediatric glaucoma are well known and established. Early diagnosis and management is critical. We need to consider the long-term implications of what we do now and preserve options for future therapies. We start with typically less invasive canal-based procedures and manage amblyopia, and we move to blood-based procedures as we need to. I personally leave cyclobated procedures as a last resort. In the adult world of glaucoma, we've seen a, a shift toward interventional glaucoma, where the gap that exists between medications and lasers with the safety but lack of efficacy compared to the very powerful trabeculectomy and tubes, this is where the new genre of microinvasive glaucoma surgeries have developed, or MIGs. The advent of MIGs is primarily based on ab internal small incision approaches, which are far less invasive and traumatic than traditional glaucoma surgery. One of the hallmarks of these procedures is the rapid recovery, as well as the high safety profile. Those of you not familiar with MIGs, perhaps may learn from this slide just to talk about the different outflow targets. MIGs can be divided based on canal-based procedures versus suprachoroidal procedures versus traditional blood-based procedures. And that's a broad design as far as how we can classify them. I don't have time to go through all the data. Unfortunately, this is, a, this is sort of a pseudo-meta-analysis looking at a variety of studies comparing different procedures in MIGs and comparing them to combined cataract versus standalone. Many MIGs procedures have been studied with combined cataract surgery, which really doesn't apply to our pediatric and childhood glaucomas for the most part. But as we can see here, these procedures have been shown to show efficacy, although generally not in the same vein as trabeculectomy. And this very simple schematic shows where we are with MIGs compared to subconjunctival MIGs procedures or minimally invasive blood procedures versus trabeculectomy. Let's just start with, trabecu with, with trabecular bypass procedures. These of course are designed to overcome the obstruction at the level of TM, whether it's, whether it's the so-called Barkans membrane or undeveloped angle, of course, this applies very relevantly to childhood glaucoma. Other procedures that we do in this space also are designed to expand the canal. These procedures do assume of course, a patent distal outflow system, which in the adult eye may not always be the case. There are a variety of canal-based procedures that have been developed over the last decade. These include stenting procedures with implantable devices. These include viscodilation procedures to dilate the canal and expand the TM and release collector channel ostea obstruction. And they include dilating, stripping, and excisional approaches. I will go through these very quickly here. I think we've all been seeing the eye stent inject W in this case, this is a very small implant, smallest in the human body that can be designed to be placed in the trabecular meshwork to bypass the TM. We see blood reflux that emerges here as we place the first device. And typically we place more than one device over the circumference within the nasal quadrant of the eye. These have been very well tolerated, quite safe, but efficacy has still been questioned as far as compared to other mixed procedures. The Hydrus device is a longer micro shunt this device covers three clock hours, is placed through a cannula, and it typically is placed in the nasal quadrant. This is made of nitinol and contains an inlet as well as a scaffold designed to expand and dilate the canal. A collapsed canal is one of the hallmarks in adult glaucoma. The, uh, also, the, the trabecular meshwork is expanded with these windows as well. And this is the second of the mixed implantable devices that we have in the canal, as we can see in this video. We have also seen eczema laser technology being applied to the trabecular meshwork. With the finesse and the stealth-like procedure, minimal traumatic inflammation, there's potentially advantages of eczema laser ablation to the TM to prevent restenosis and closure. Up to 10 spots can be placed in the trabecular meshwork as seen in this video as well. And these post-operative pictures show the trabeculostomies that have been opened in the TM. Moving to more excisional approaches is the hook dual blade. This is a dual blade designed to incise and also to remove a strip of trabecular meshwork. This is typically done in a localized area, typically 90 to 120 degrees. And basically you can see the tip being placed in the trabecular meshwork in the canal and slid across. This actually creates an excision here of the, of the trabecular meshwork and actually provides a specimen. 
and what we call so-called goniectomy here, as we see in, this, in these pictures. There's a TM that's been opened up now and actually removed. The Trabex, Trabectoma, and also Trabex Plus also are designed to do this. And we can see the excisional goniotomy here or goniectomy as this, this tissue is removed. Uh, for the adult eye, certainly this may provide some advantage for prevention of closure due to the cut trabecular meshwork flaps. We've all seen the, uh, the, the use of ab external and ab internal suture trabeculotomy that's been popularized by in, the, in the congenital world first, of course, and then now migrated to the adult world. This is a widely accessible procedure that can be used with a 5 poly polypropylene suture that's basically the tip is melted with uh, hot temp, low temp cautery. A goniotomy is made in the angle here and using a micro forcep, using an ab internal approach in this case, the suture is placed through the trabecular meshwork into the canal. Typically in adult eyes, we do 180 degrees up to 360 degrees. In congenital and pediatric glaucoma, we typically do 360 degrees. As in this case, we can see the suture is passed all the way around the canal, grabbed internally, and then pulled externally to basically open up trabecular meshwork. And of course, we, look, we owe folks like Mary Lynch and Alan Beck in the pediatric world a lot of credit for these procedures being developed ab external. And Devinder Grover and Ron Fellman developing into the ab internal approaches, considering that the visibility here is adequate. Devices have also been designed to also uh, incise the trabecular meshwork and pass suture catheters as well. This is the omnisurgical system, which is a one-handed system that can be used to incise the trabecular meshwork as well as pass this filament through the trabecular meshwork and into the canal what to must, inject the scholastic as well. And now we can see uh, the catheter passed around 180 degrees on either side the viscoelastic injection can help dilate and release collector channel ostia, and the suture can be used to also cut and strip the trabecular meshwork as well. A lot of work has been done in the pediatric population as well with microcatheter trabeculotomy, and we typically now use combined approaches as we're showing here using the microcatheter. Use of viscoelastic can be also be used to inject with the microcatheter here. The lit tip uh, illuminated end helps visualization, which I think facilitates passage in some of these difficult pediatric eyes as well, and ensures placement within the canal as well. There's the goniotomy being made, there's the catheter being placed, and it can again go around 360 degrees and be used again to do a trabeculotomy as we showed earlier with GAT. We also combine these procedures often with adding stenting as well to provide both viscodilation, cutting, and stenting as well. Of course, the question still, still remains, what about going beyond the canal in pediatric eyes that require further work? And we've seen now a movement away from tubes and traps <clears throat> in adult eyes and more toward micro stenting approaches. And these approaches are designed to be less invasive, more controlled, and, and with the resultant more posterior blood formation and the use of mitomycin that can be increased because of the safety of these procedures. The lumen of these devices are designed to prevent hypotony and the placement of outflow is more posterior. And this again allows for a more posterior and a safer blood to be formed. That can be done ab internal or ab external. And again, we've seen an improved safety and efficacy. The material may also be a benefit, and we've seen this again in adult eyes, with reduced fibrosis around these devices compared to silicone, which may be very particularly relevant to pediatric eyes. Again, the blebs are quite diffuse, and this is very relevant again to prevent avascularity and potentially leakage. So I've gone through a potpourri of options here for MIGs and MIBs in kids. The use of these adjunctive tools can facilitate and enhance circumferential trabeculotomy with or without goniectomy, with or without implantable devices. We've seen an improvement in blood-based procedures with microshunt implants, and this has resulted in increased use of antifibrotics in a safer manner. Typically, these are used in my experience with pediatric eyes prior to going to conventional trabs and tubes. And I'll just add the supercortical procedures, while there's potential here, we are cautious, of course, in the pediatric population. Thank you again for allowing me to share where we are with MIGs and adult eyes, and I hope we continue to do work in the pediatric population. Thank you very much. Ike, thank you. That was pretty awesome. Um, as you uh, unshare your screen and Shiguro gets ready to present, I had a quick question for you. When do we take adult work and transit it to children? Do we need you know, a, a large multi-centered studies, which means that'll never happen? Um, or when, when can we conceptually shift that? And then after Shiguro's conversation with us, we'll have a discussion with the both of you uh, and the whole topic. But I wanted to get your thought about that one question. Well, you know, historically, as you know, David, it took many, many decades before we saw tubes and traps move on to the pediatric world, uh, you know, beyond angle surgery. 
And of course, I started off with anecdotal reports and case series. You know, we've now had experience and we've seen some limited published reports and all these procedures that we've just described in the pediatric world. And I think that's what it's going to take. It's going to take some of these anecdotal experiences. It's very hard, as you know, of course, to do an RCT in adult eyes and, of course, probably impossible in pediatric eyes. So it's going to take a very careful approach, uh, anecdotal approach, a very monitored approach by some of us. And we've already started this work already with collaboration with our pediatric colleagues. But certainly, unfortunately, this is a neglected area. And I, I wish that we had more investigations and more work in this. So maybe this will spur some of us to do more work in this area. Fabulous. And I can tell you that my phone's lit up with thousands of questions that are coming in through online. And we'll combine those with uh, the discussion with Shiguru after he's done. Shiguru, the platform is all yours. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think uh, that do you, do you see my uh, slides or so? Oh, thank you very much yes. for, uh, yeah, okay. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Uh, I'd like to talk a bit about the uh, dry eye and inflammatory MGD therapies uh, for adults and also the four children. My name is Kinoshita, I'm from Japan. Well, uh, let's look at the two types of the dry eyes. Uh, as you know, uh, ACUS deficient dry eye and the evaporative dry eye. So this is a general consensus in a worldwide basis. However, uh, at least in, in an Asian country, we've been proposing the uh, short beauty type dry eye uh, that you could see uh, instantly after blinking, uh, you could see the, uh, the spot break or so without any superficial punctate keratopathy. It's because of the uh, dryness of the ocular surface. Well, uh, thanks to uh, Professor uh, Norihiko Yokoi. Uh, uh, he's the, uh, the professor of my, our department and also he's the president of the Japan Dry Eye Society. Using just by fluorescing and tear film breakup pattern, not the schirma test or the BUT measurement, you could easily uh, tell whether they have a dry eye or not. Also, uh, you could uh, tell the differentiation of all uh, three uh, subcategories of the dry eye. For instance, ACAS deficient dry eye shows the, either the area break or line break, uh, highlighted in, uh, in the right-hand side, and the uh, short BUT type dry eye showed spot break or dimple break. And also evaporative dry eye showed the random break. So as I mentioned to you, for especially for the children, uh, you are a bit difficult to do the serum test or BUT measurement, but just by uh, seeing the uh, tear film breakup pattern, you can easily tell whether or not the dry eye exists. And then the pharmaceutical uh, treatment, it's more like a glaucoma treatment, medical treatment. Uh, there are three at least uh, different kinds of the mechanisms for the treatment of the dry eye. One is uh, I try to promote the uh, acus retention or the secretion by the artificial tear or hyaluronic acid eye drops, but also uh, the try to promote the mucus secretion uh, uh, by the rebamipide or the quaso sodium. These are, I think, um, made uh, released by the Japanese pharmaceutical company, but uh, they are also have a dual effect. For instance, the vessel sodium has a, a acus secretion as well as a mucus secretion. The bamipad has a mucus secretion and also some kind of anti-inflammatory uh, thing effects as well. Uh, uh, the most important thing is probably anti-inflammatory uh, treatment. Uh, uh, somebody may use a low-dose steroid, uh, but if you do not uh, have the cyclosporin or LFA1 antagonist in uh, some of the countries, uh, you have to use a steroid, but anti inflammatory agent as well. But generally speaking, there are very few dry eye patients in younger ages because the, their tear film is excellent, quite healthy as compared to adults, especially senior persons or so. However, we do see dry eye children with Sjögren's disease, although the number is very low, but still the, the kids also has a Sjögren disease and also Steven Johnson syndrome at the chronic phase or GVHD or so. Furthermore, we may encounter the inflamed myobomian gland dysfunction or the disease associated with dry eye in children and adolescent. I would like to stress to you, this is probably the important, I think, ocular surface disease in, uh, in the children and adolescent. While well, thinking about uh, the difference or the similarity of the, the two diseases, myobomian gland dysfunction and dry eye, there's some of the overlap, but not the identical. What about myobomitis? Myobomitis is also the overlap with the myobomian gland dysfunction or the dry eye, but it's not the identical. We call the myobomitis as a posterior blepharitis. 
Well, thanks to uh, Professor Tomo Suzuki at uh, Kyoto Prefecture University of Medicine. Uh, uh, many years ago, uh, year 2005 or so, she described the myelomyelitis related keratoconjunctivitis. One just a tiny uh, uh, myelomyelitis could induce the freak tenure keratitis or superficial, superficial punctate uh, keratitis with a corneal infiltrate, or sometimes uh, that could induce the granuloma. This is not the infection, but the pathogen related uh, the, the host uh, defense mechanism make such kind of granuloma. Well, and then well, we, we have performed the, some of the systemic review uh, uh, whether the, these uh, four diseases are similar or the identical or the one unit of the, of the clinical entity or so, pediatric ocular rosacea, freak tenure, keratitis, or childhood brephalokeratoconjunctivitis. So according to the, our systemic uh, review we published in uh, Ocular Surface uh, uh, several years ago, uh, they are female dominant, so it's girl dominant, and then a young, uh, uh, the, the, the girls, and then uh, their ocular surface did show the myobomian gland abnormalities and corneal infiltrates and superficial corneal uh, neovascularization. And the treatment is a systemic antimicrobial agent. It's quite effective. Well, let's look at a five-year-old girl and uh, she developed, she developed the uh, freak tenure keratitis with the uh, posterior brephritis, that means the myobomitis. That myobomitis is the, uh, uh, the paso, pa, uh, pathogenesis of these diseases. Well, and then when we uh, 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 try to correct the, uh, the myobium from these patients, the about two thirds did show the P acne and uh, uh, as compared to the uh, age matched normal uh, controls. So the, probably this is still the presumption, but we presume the P acne is a target uh, for the treatment. For instance, antimicrobial uh, treatment uh, systemically and also the topically without any steroid use that these uh, myobomitis related uh, uh, keratoconjunctivitis, MRKC or uh, pediatric uh, acne rosacea or so that could uh, 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 we, we could uh, have a complete remission of this uh, corneal surface. And also you could see that even though the cornea is a pacified or infiltrating, eventually cornea become transparent. So the myobomian gland and ocular surface is a one unit. You have to think about that. If the information occurs on the ocular surface, please take a look at the uh, uh, myobomian gland, the lead margin, and then uh, and microbe may uh, uh, have uh, some kind of involvement in this disease categories or so. So this is the, uh, the kind of um, uh, the summary of a myomitis related keratoconjunctivitis. All these are the, the patients are uh, children or adolescent. And you could see all these patients did show the myomitis, especially in the upper uh, lid. So this is a last uh, the, uh, slide, young, female, there's a multiple history of a charachia, the P acne is involved and the antimicrobial agents such as cyclo, uh, uh, I think cephalosporin or uh, macrolide or azithromycin is quite effective for the treatment of these diseases. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Shiguru. That was phenomenal. Thank you. And uh, um, I really want to open up uh, the discussion, really, for the first two talks to the whole mm -hmm. panel. Um, I, 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 I want to go back to David's question um, to Ike. I want to open it to the whole panel, Shiguru, to you first. Um, mm -hmm. How do we take adult uh, technologies such as, let's say, talk about the rock inhibitor. How do you introduce that into the pediatric world? What's the best way? Should it be uh, investigators like yourself who involve children? Should, how do we do this? How do we bring technology to children faster? Oh. Well, I think it's a, it's a very difficult question because the always uh, regulatory uh, science or the regulatory issue is a, is a key. Of course, uh, uh, if you think uh, raw kinase inhibitor is effective, but still uh, we have to prove the safety issues, especially in children. So uh, 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 safety issue is a key. And uh, also, the, for instance, you, if you're thinking of the 
eye drops of the lock inhibitor uh, for the corneal endothelial dysfunction or so. I would say that the sum of the defect of the corneal endothelial is necessary. If the kids has a sum of the endothelial damage and uh, lose the sum of the endothelial cells, at that time, low kinase inhibitor has to be very effective. But uh, if the endothelial cell density is just lower uh, in the children, I think low kinase inhibitor is not so effective. But the safety issue, we have to prove. Okay, thank you. Um, so we, we, there are a couple of questions coming in. Uh, so can I ask you, Ike, uh, what what is the what is the the youngest age that you've done a MIG, uh, and how effective has your uh, experience been in uh, teenagers and, and and younger? Yeah, so Ken, you know, I mean, I always start uh, as I'm sure most of us do with angle based procedures, and and my preference is to use a microcatheter, uh, whether it's ab external uh, in a congenital case where the view is very poor through the cornea or whether it's ab internal where I get an adequate view and even endoscopically assisted to do that. I prefer to go ab internal in the vast majority of cases uh, with, with, with these young eyes and preserving conjunctiva. That's my first approach. And I think the microcatheter greatly facilitates the uh, passage <coughs> of the device through the canal as opposed to using a suture, which is of course is, is more widely accessible. That's my first approach. And I would say that based on uh, my experience and those that have been published also with RCTs as we've seen, from India and other ways around the world, that there's a greater efficacy and a greater probability of getting circumferential trabeculotomies, which parlay into a greater efficacy with IOP lowering. So that's my first approach, and I think it's been great. I think the, um, the cost, of course, is a factor as well. Not, not a lot of experience with stenting itself in the, in the pediatric population in the canal, although in more of the older pediatric patients, meaning you know teenage uh, or juvenile cases, uh, we've had some success in there. Where I'm really excited about is an area that I think we really lack uh, a good a procedure is the subconjunctival bleb-based procedures. You know, tubes have their issues, of course, in these young patients with exposure, corneal issues, and lack of efficacy as well, and maintenance. And traps, of course, we know the issues around use of mitomycin, which I think we need to use for these cases with, of course, conjunctival breakdown, hypotony, and the rest of the things that occur with this and long-term infection. These micro shunts, I think, really provide an advantage uh, to reduce those risks while still maintaining good efficacy. And I have personally now, my youngest patient that I've used a bleb-based microshunt now has been four years of age. Uh, mm. We use ologen as well. We use mitomycin. We use post-operative adjuncts as needed. And I will cautiously say, and again, I say this cautiously because our numbers are still <clears throat> you know, below 20 in the pediatric, uh, in those young patients. I, I'm very optimistic that I think this is going to, this is the preferred bleb-based procedure once you move beyond the angle uh, to proceed to. So this is where I see the future is. Uh, I've been encouraged with the control, lack of hypotony because of the benefit of the small lumen. Um, and myself and others uh, around have now been using these devices in that population. So that's where we're at. Many teenagers that we've done as well, of course, um, in, in that group. That's, a, that's my quick anecdotal personal experience, Ken. That's great. David, I want to pull you in. My bone gland dysfunction in children, I want the whole panel on this. I mean, it is, it is so common. Uh, and Shiguru has uh, given us a great uh, talk of his experience. Uh, what's your experience, David and Namrata? I mean, Andy, I'm sure, I know you're a neuro-ophthalmologist, but these kids are all over the place. I mean- Yeah. They, it, it, Ken, you know, I mean, I, I've had the pleasure of working with uh, Stuart Brown in the beginning of my career. Mm -hmm. And honestly, in my training uh, for uh, pediatric ophthalmology, it, it never came up. It was Stuart Brown who first pointed this out to me uh, in children who we were having difficulty with. He also showed me what Shiguro pointed out, which is that the cornea will clear uh, mm -hmm. as well. And I was, it was really, um, uh, pardon the pun, eye-opening to me to, mm -hmm. to learn that. I think this gets missed. I think mm -hmm. that um, we uh, ignore it. And a lot of the, the, the difficulty we see in children are related to this. Mm -hmm. Shiguro, I think that you would probably agree. Well, thank you very much. I think especially uh, when we see these patients or the kids, we start using the steroid. I think it's okay, but uh, that could make a partial remission. Uh, and then uh, it's come and go, recur and so on. And during that time, cornea got haze, infiltrate, and some of the basal ingrowth. At that time, we have to have a proper antimicrobial agent, especially, I would say, systemically, not only for the topical. That could that could make the complete remission of that. So that is, 
our uh, I think proposal. You know, you can, must... can I... Sorry, oh, go ahead. Sorry, no, no. You must... so, so can uh, yeah, we have a different subset of patients mm -hmm. uh, as far as uh, bovine gland disease in children mm -hmm. is concerned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, get a uh, lot of uh, step staphylococcal blepharokeratoconjunctivitis and post uh -huh. that uh, you know uh, MGD coupled with MGD. Then mm -hmm. we get a lot of rectangular keratoconjunctivitis, which I think Shigeru also you know mm -hmm. showed along mm -hmm. with the disease of the mm -hmm. mammalian glands. Mm -hmm. And I think for us, uh, acute SJS occurs a lot more commonly in the younger age group. So consequent to that. Uh, we get a lot of pediatric patients who have uh, involvement of the meibomian glands. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. our subset would be slightly different, you know, from uh, from uh, what is there all over the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think also that depending upon the hygiene status, uh, the posterior blepharitis sometimes combined with the anterior blepharitis. If they have anterior blepharitis, they have a staph, uh, I think, uh, involvement as well. So. Uh, I, I think uh, anyway, so we really have to see the uh, upper eyelids, uh, whether they have uh, information or not, uh, uh, when you see the, some of the ocular surface information as well. Try to Can see as a I unit. To... Sorry, Shigeru, I apologize. But the question I was gonna ask uh, all of our experts and Ken, you included, is how much this contributes to other disease that we see, um, you know, when, when you do, um, uh, of transplants or if people have keratoconus, how much does the ocular surface disease um, contribute to that? And how much does that have to be paid attention to when you're treating the other problems of the front of the eye? Uh -huh. the child? I think not, not necessarily treating, but uh, whenever we see that some of the abnormality on the ocular surface, we always see that the lid just to make sure it is okay or not or so. For instance, for cornea transplantation, most of the patient, not, not, not Fuchs dystrophy, but the most of the ocular surface disease or infectious disease or sometimes glaucoma patients, they use a medical treatment or so. Their lid is somewhat abnormal. Yeah, Even David, I want to case. add a comment with, with mm. glaucoma. I mean, mm. we see significant mm. ocular surface mm. disease in adult mm. eyes. And of course, mm. we would parlay that to pediatric mm. eyes with drops. But not only that, mm we don't pay attention enough to the ocular surface pre-conjunctival mm. surgery. Mm. And the optimization of the lid margin mm. and the conjunctival mm. surface, I mm. believe is very relevant mm. to the success, mm. both short mm. and long-term yeah. for blood based procedures. Mm. Uh, so yeah. I think that is very relevant. And I think, mm. uh, you know, we're still learning in our mm. world and I'm glad mm. to hear that it's something mm. that is, you know, yeah. uh, here that we're talking about with pediatric mm. eyes. Mm. Uh, Andy, Richard, any comments? Neuroop has no comment. <laughs> can, I, can, I, can, I, can I ask Ike about the treatment of the Peter's anomaly? Please. Sure. Yeah. So I think, the, for instance, uh, Peter's anomaly with uh, some of the, I, I would say, that high integral pressure and in, uh, like uh, uh, age or uh, one or two years of age or so. What's the what's, uh, best uh, uh, choice for the, the kind of glaucoma surgery or decrease in the integral pressure? Well, how much time do we have? But you know, these, these are these are complex, you know, eyes with multiple <laughs> yes. mobilities, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think specifically to glaucoma, and I still approach those with angle-based procedures. I mean, these uh -huh. patients have you know uh, angle anomalies, underdeveloped angles mm. as well. Mm. Mm. And I think the first approach should be to uh, you know use the angle. The problem, of course, often you have to deal with angle closure and other issues mm. as well, mm -hmm. and that should be designed and managed accordingly as well. So that's kind of mm. what I would start with, of course, and along with the anterior segment reconstruction that may be required with these mm -hmm. difficult eyes. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm you. just going to make Richard. a comment. I, mean, I think if the, if the view is good enough, angle surgery is fine, but often if mm -hmm. it's really severe and you're mm -hmm. having to do a corneal transplant, mm -hmm. it makes mm -hmm. angle surgery more difficult, mm -hmm. but I agree still, mm -hmm. still valuable. We could, clearly the discussion is going to take off when we uh, start again. Uh, <laughs> Ken, I think Richard right. wanted to, uh, Ken, I think yeah. Richard wanted to just make yeah, a quick I comment. I just want to ask Ike, uh, one of the, um, groups of patients, pediatric patients, that get glaucoma, which is really, really difficult to treat, are the kids with JIA. What is your preferred approach with these kids? And does MIGS work in them? You know, JIA is one of those procedures where we have the, some of the highest success rate. And I'm talking about even, you know, young adults as well with angle-based procedures. So my approach is always to approach the angle here, typically doing a 360 adventure trabeculotomy 
with or without stenting, perhaps, you know, you could argue that in, in some eyes as well. Of course, we have to consider the fact they may be sneaky and other things that we release as well. But I love doing a 360 microcatheter assisted viscodilation and 360 trabeculotomy, releases any PAS that may be there and certainly can open up that angle. Some of our best results are in exactly that population as well. Interesting. And Shigura, could I ask you a, a question? Sure. Um, one of the things that is apparent in the young adult population now is increasing dry eye disease because of screen use. Yes. Is this yes. That you're starting to see in children. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not so sure about the children. The children, uh, generally speaking, when we see the uh, screen or uh, smartphone or so, blinking rate is decreasing. Mm -hmm. So, so that's uh, that induced the kind of a short beauty type dry eye, not not acus deficient dry eye. And then, uh, even though that situation uh, younger, uh, like at uh, ten years of age or so, their tear is so. So excellent, I think, even though they could tolerate of that. So they, they, they probably do not uh, uh, make the uh, dry eye situations. So that is my way of thinking. So um, we're, we're, we're getting so many more questions and so much more about <laughs> this discussion alone could go on, but we do have three more talks we want to get to and have discussion related sure, to sure. that. Uh, and, and our next talk is, um, Andy, I don't think you're going to talk about ocular surface disease. Uh, maybe you are as part of... Uh, <laughs> Space related, but we'll, we'll find out. Uh, Andy Lee is up next. So I'm going to be talking to you about something you've never heard about and has no kids in it. Space flight associated neuroocular syndrome, SANS, is a unique neuroophthalmic disorder of space flight. It has no terrestrial equivalent here on Earth. There are no Earth cases of SANS. It is a space flight disorder. I'm required by the United States to read this verbatim. Dr. Vali works as a consultant for NASA, but the views expressed here do not necessarily reflect those of the space agency or the United States government. However, I do work for Baylor College of Medicine's Center for Space Medicine, which is located here in Houston, Texas. On July 20th, 1969, I was five years old. The moon landing was on our TV. Our TV was black and white. It said this, live from the moon. Houston was the very first word spoken from the moon that day. Houston, tranquility base here. The eagle has landed. In 1978, I was in high school. These are my classmates. I've grown a little bit since I was in high school. We're all in the same grade. I skipped some grades. My second choice was to work for NASA. My third choice was Jedi Knight. And it turns out that the force is real. Shiguro is a grand master. David is a Jedi master. Everybody on this call is a Jedi Knight and we do use the force every day. The force is real and SANS is no different. So let me just tell you what we are seeing in space. Optic disc edema, globe flattening, choroidal folds and a hyperopic shift from axial uh, shortening created by fluid pushing against the back of the eye in astronauts after long duration space flight. And you can read about this in the original paper from ophthalmology. You can also read more in the JNO I and in archives about SANS if you're interested in this topic, it is fascinating. And of course, this being a worldwide audience and, a, a, and WSPS being a worldwide uh, event, we have our friends from Canada and the Canadian Space Agency, the European Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency, and of course, our friends, the Russians. And it's a very mysterious syndrome that's been impairing astronauts' eyes and the lay press has gone to a lot of hyperbole about this mysterious syndrome. And hopefully I'm gonna be able to take away some of the mystery of SANS. Houston is the home to the Johnson Space Center, which is the home to mission control, which means all the astronauts live in Houston. This is what we've seen over a now almost 12 year timeline. Choroidal folds in an astronaut on return in 2003, optic disc edema and a cotton wool spot in 2005, in 2007, another cotton wool spot in a different flyer. In 2008, bilateral optic disc edema. And it turns out that 50% of the flyers on the International Space Station, ISS, get a hyperopic shift from the shortening of the globe that occurs from the fluid pushing on the back of the eye. And I'll show you that. And in 2011, that original report from Mater et al. And in 2013, we had a, a flyer who went back into space and got it again. So there's clearly a dose response curve here. And in 2016, OCT and now OCT2 on the station shows we have subclinical changes in the choroid even before we see anything ophthalmoscopically. 
And so I'm only authorized to share with you the original data because the, some of the flyers are still in space. Seven of 10 astronauts in the original cohort, and we look at their uh, pre-flight refractive status. We take fundus photographs and do an OCT before they fly. And on Earth, they come back, have an orbital MRI and a lumbar puncture. You can't do an MRI or a lumbar puncture on the International Space Station. And we check their vision and the post-flight questionnaire. So on the movies and TV, the spacecraft always looks so clean and there's all this space, but in the real space station, there's no space and every wall is covered because there, there are no walls. The roof and the floor and the so there, there's no roof. The astronauts do their own visual acuity, check their own intraocular pressure, do the OCT on themselves and the ultrasound on each other and themselves. That's the kind of person that becomes a United States astronaut. And you can see one of our female flyers here, she is checking her own acuity. And then she's gonna record that data. And then she's gonna do an ultrasound and an IOP with a tono pen on her buddies or his buddies, depending. So on the International Space Station, we have intraocular pressure, uh, a fundus camera, OCT and OCT2, an ultrasound. So these are the things we have on the station. We have no MRI, we have no lumbar puncture. And this is the kind of thing that we see, peripapillary nerve fiber layer edema. It's usually freezing grade one or two, mild edema. And just to show you that in space, we have no enemies. These are our friends, the Russians, cosmonauts and astronauts perform these tests on one another. And this is what we see when they come back to earth. Pre-flight, you can see there's no flattening of the globe here, but post-flight, you can see this flattening of the globe. And that is what is causing the, sh the hyperopic shift and also the choroidal folds and the um, optic disc edema probably. So we can see this on MRI. And on OCT, you can see pre-flight, they're normal, but post-flight, we've got this choroidal perfusion uh, in the choroidal folds that are developing and concomitant synchronous retinal folds on the top. So here's pre-flight and post-flight in a flyer. And I just want you to look, there's no choroidal folds here, but in the bottom, there's choroidal folds there and also the cotton wool spot. So you can see the folds here, right here. I, can, I hope you can see those little lines right there. That was not present pre-flight. Neither was that cotton wool spot. And so we have disc edema and the OCT changes. You can see the nerve fiber layer is getting thicker and thicker here. And pre-flight versus post-flight, there's no question that this is freezing grade 2-3 edema. It's real edema, not pseudo edema. And if you wanna read more about OCT in SANS, you can look at this archives paper, 15 astronauts with variable degrees of retinal nerve fiber layer thickening. Uh, and now that we have OCT2 and enhanced depth imaging, we're gonna look at the core. So here's one of our most affected flyers. This is launch minus 32, 32 days prior to launch, return to earth plus five, return to earth plus 18, 41 days, 80 days, and now 225 days after return are, we have resolution of the disc edema that has occurred over time here. And the predominant hypothesis is that there's a cephalid fluid shift. It gets stuck right here at the canal. There's no gravitational field to pull it back down. And so the fluid just acts mechanically to cause the findings that we see in the eye. And that is what we see radiographically. The fluid is in the sheath and the fluid itself reaches that dead end, flattens the globe and causes the hyperopic shift. And so here's the choroidal folds right there again. You can see that on this red free, the choroidal folds here. And on pre-flight versus post-flight OCT, we can see the choroidal folds and then the co concomitant synchronous and asynchronous retinal folds that are occurring on station. So this is an on-station event. We can see it on the OCT in space. And that fluid shift can be seen in the astronauts' faces. So you can see in this female flyer, the change in her facial configuration and her facial features from being in space. And so there's some seriously weird things about what we are seeing in space. The best thing we have is closest terrestrial equivalent is idiopathic intracranial hypertension, which as you know, is obese young females. And that doesn't look anything like a United States astronaut. None of our females, our females could beat up our males. I mean, that's the kind of person that becomes a United States astronaut. Headache, transient visual obscurations, pulsatile tinnitus, and diplopia, all the symptoms at IIH on Earth are not seen at all in astronauts. So in summary, I've shown you something that is truly unique, a disorder that has no terrestrial equivalent, 
you literally get to hear about a disease that has never been seen on planet Earth. The neuroophthalmic findings, choroidal folds, cotton wool patch, hyperopic shift, and optic disc edema. And it defines a new syndrome called spaceflight associated neuroocular syndrome, SANS. It might be a barrier to our planned mission to Mars. And the predominant hypothesis is cephalid fluid shift, but there are other hypotheses, including increased intracranial pressure, one carbon pathway abnormalities, carbon dioxide, et cetera. None of them have been as attractive to us and certainly not the ophthalmology as much as the cephalid fluid shift. I told you on July 20th, 1969, I was five years old and this was on our TV. That's what I was thinking on July 20th, 1969, as every five-year-old watching TV that day was feeling that exact same way. Instead, I became this. I told you that I live in Houston, Texas, and that is why I get to work on the project, not because of me, but because I live next to Johnson Space Center. So Johnson Space Center is the home of astronauts, including my friend here, who's a doctor, Mike Fair. I am looking forward to the day when I hear Houston be the first word from the red planet, Mars. Houston, tranquility base here. The eagle has landed. Manned mission to Mars. Plan timeline, 2030 to 2040. And I hope I'm here to do it. I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to work for NASA. I wanted to be a Jedi Knight. It turns out I get to do all three. So we're hoping to solve this problem and get ready to go to Mars. I thank you for your time and attention. Holy moly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what to say. I mean, uh, Andy, that's mind blowing. That is so cool. And um, we all know that this was just an attempt to, to put neuro-ophthalmologists as the first ophthalmologist in space. Um, and that you made the whole thing up. So no, but uh, all right. So a couple of quick questions and I'll kick off. Um, besides that being an amazing talk and, and incredible information. Um, I, I, and I'll fire off a few at once. So this is gravity related. What, what happens to when we have a moon base and a Mars base? Uh, does this, we know this doesn't happen in pilots because we would have seen it before. So it's not acceleration related. Um, and um, the centrifugal, they spin the space station does that seem to make it better? And is there permanent damage when they're done? Sorry to fire all that at you once. So there's no permanent damage. We have longitudinal studies. Nobody's lost their vision. Some of the structural changes don't go away, however, particularly the choroidal folds. The disc edema goes away, but the hyperopic shift and accelerated presbyopia does not go away. It's not been seen in short-term flyers, which as you noticed, uh, we know that from the shuttle. We know that from uh, our missions to the moon. Nobody had this before long duration space flight defined as three to six months. It is unique to microgravity, but it's probably not unique in terms of the pathogenesis because we have an on the ground analog, which is the head down tilt. So we can put people head down and do the same shifting thing and we can see the same findings. So um, the whole spinning thing, you know, in, in the movies, they always have a artificial gravity that is actually technically feasible. There's nothing that keeps us from doing it. That's a cost thing. So, uh, so you're talking about a trillion dollars maybe to, to make that thing. So on the, in the movies, it so, seems so easy, but it's not. All right, last question for me, and then I want to throw it over to the panel. These are astronauts who are used to having perfect vision, and you're describing accelerated hyperopia and presbyopia What's their response on a personal level to having their vision change this way? So NASA, of course, sent up a countermeasure. They called it space anticipation glasses. You might know them as reading glasses. The reading glasses fully corrected the hyperopic shift. And so it's kind of like the Walmart up there with the rack. They got a selection of reading glasses uh, that they choose from, depending on the amount of shift. It's usually between plus 0.75 and 1.50, it does not, it's never impacted mission quality. They, they're easily corrected in space and they have the space anticipation glasses to help them get through it. And as you alluded to though, a United States astronaut or a Japanese astronaut or a Russian cosmonaut, they are not complaining about anything. Um, and one of the things that we had already discussed is making it a one way. So instead of trying to come back, it would be a colonization. There are already many, many tiers for a one-way ticket to Mars. Wow. Uh, it's, it's blowing up here. So the questions are, uh, in long 
what does it say? Oh yeah, it says in uh, long stay um, travelers, any effects of UV radiation that you're aware of? Yeah, so the, the, the spacecraft is partially shielded, but we don't know all the particles because our atmosphere protects us from these things. I'll just give you a small anecdote. Astronauts in space sometimes have photopsias where they, they say a flash hits them. And we believe that correlates with cosmic radiation and solar flare activity. So no, we know they are being bombarded and that their retina is being hit by high energy particles. That's actually one of the major risks of going to Mars, not this. The risk is your brain is gonna get bombarded with cosmic rays. In the movies, you end up being the Fantastic Four, but in the real, real world, you end up being the unfantastic people if you get brain radiation. Um, I think that's what causes the cotton wool spots. I don't think that's related to the, flow, the shift and the, the microgravity. How could that cause a cotton wool spot? So yeah, I think there is radiation exposure. We know it does occur, but it's so intermittent and it's completely unpredictable. In fact, in space, if there was a big solar flare activity, it would probably kill everyone on the station. So, um, so you know, we have such nice panelists. They're sort of being very polite. Speak up, guys, you've got questions. Uh, uh, I, go ahead. Hey, Andy, uh, great talk as always. You know, of course, and you know, this is the opposite in glaucoma. We're trying to basically address you know, translaminar pressure in another way. I know, you, I know you're aware of the multi-dial goggles that we've been trying to play around with to actually lower the pressure in the eye with the, uh, with the pure environment. I mean, what are your thoughts just on finding ways to increase IOP transiently uh, with some sort of pure multi-dial goggles or any other way to do that to address this problem, maybe even transiently? Yeah, so we've been in discussions with John Berdahl about the goggles and his goggles. And, um, we checked IOP, so we sent that tonal pen up there. As you know, that tonal pen thing has to be calibrated with gravity on Earth, so that was a big hassle to make it not need to be gravitational dependent. Um, IOP slowly goes up in space, and then it goes back to normal very quickly. So one of the hypotheses was that maybe it was hypotony, because it looks similar, right? Uh, you get choroidal folds, you get a disc edema, and hypotony maculopathy could could have been the cause, but it wasn't. IOP totally stone cold stable on, on station. The goggles, as you know, are like swimming goggles. That would impair mission. I mean, and, uh, and it's a hard sell to say we're gonna cause like a ocular hypertension. Uh, however, this is, we're looking at this in the, on the ground because we have that terrestrial analog, the head down thing. So putting goggles on people head down, that is the next phase of testing the hypothesis about the translaminar pressure gradient as a potential countermeasure to SANS. But first we got to test it on Earth. Andy, I got a great question here from, um, before we go to a number of the, from Warren Hindle. He says, why the posterior pole? Has bells and sleep position been considered? So the astronauts sleep standing up because there's no gravitational field. So none of the positional things that happen at sleep or position matter. Half the astronauts are like on their head and they're sleeping. Uh, there's no position. Uh, CO2 was looked at though, and they wore CO2 monitors during their sleep, but then that was fine. Um, so position, no, it doesn't matter. On earth position matters because the head, the gravity, no gravity, right. no positional change. Namrata, you had a question? I'm sure Shigeru, Shigeru also has that question. Any uh, corneal edema or any corneal changes or uh, uh, any epithelial edema or anything like that? No, but we don't have a slit lamp and we don't have an ophthalmologist on station, of, of course. Uh, however, um, we don't know, I guess is what I would say. There's no, there's no apparent corneal thing from gross looking or when they come back. So there's never been any evidence of corneal edema or any corneal change uh, in the flyers. It seems to be posterior segment only matching with the cephalid fluid shift as the mechanism. Uh, I think I need, yeah, can I? Sorry. Uh, uh, I think in, in the future, I think kids will go to the space also. So uh, what do you <laughs> expect or what do you presume? The elasticity of the globe is different. So what do you, what do you, what do you presume? What? So yeah, one day kids will go to space. And if there's a colonization effort, there will be kids on Mars. So they will have Martian citizenship. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I think elasticity probably does have something to do with it. Uh, Shiguro, you would, might be interested to know that there are ethnic differences. So we don't have a big sample size. It's like Ike's story about how he has like two kids. So we have like two Japanese, we have 
and the Russians, even though they're our friends, they're kind of our frenemy. I'm speaking for myself now, not the United States government, and mm -hmm. they don't share the data with us. So when we talk, approach the Russians and my counterparts in, in Space City, um, they said, we don't have that. That's a, that's a sin of the decadent West. Sorry. Thank you. Andy, you, you said that uh, these, these guys and, and girls get better over time. Is there anything that you do to accelerate this uh, resolution? We don't do anything. Uh, we do have Diamox on the station. We haven't used it. As you know, if you have a kidney stone, it hurts. And if you had a kidney stone on the station, that would be a several million dollar return. Uh, and so we, we haven't deployed the Diamox either on Earth or in space. No countermeasures have been deployed except the reading glasses. What about when they return to Earth? Is there anything that you do to uh, assist there? No, and it just seems to go away by itself. As you saw, it takes up to 225 days. Mm -hmm. And then the choroidal folds don't seem to go away in some people. And then we just correct their presbyopia. It has been a problem when they return to Earth because the age of the astronaut core has aged. So in the beginning, if you saw that movie, The Right Stuff, everyone is like 25 years old, test pilot for the Air Force. Uh, now our average astronaut is 41 years old has a PhD in astrophysics from MIT and was the Olympic bobsled all first alternate. That's the kind of person that becomes the United States astronaut. <laughs> Look, uh, we, uh, we, this, could go, this could go on forever, but I've got one question and then I'm gonna uh, introduce Richard. The question is, is uh, contact lens pressure monitoring is available, but you are using tono pens. Um, any, any move to using uh, continuous monitoring with contact lenses? So the, the issues in space is we have to compete with other hardware to fly up there. So like sending something this big is a million dollars. So <laughs> if something's already up there, they're, they're just not going to replace it. And there are things that need to be replaced, like seriously need to be replaced. But there's, uh, you know, budget. I, I'm speaking for myself now, not the United States government. But yeah, there are budgetary constraints for say, I would like to have an MRI. And a uh, lumbar puncture, but no. Okay, I mean, I just, I feel like, I feel like a child in a candy shop. This is just having all of you guys here is just amazing. We've got two more talks, so we're going to move on and come back to more discussion. Um, uh, I'm going to share um, my slides. Uh, Richard Packard has joined us, but he's in Scotland, uh, and so he sent me a pre-recorded, uh, and so he'll be able to discuss. But I'm going to play his. He recorded now. I'd like to thank Initial for asking me to be part of this webinar on updates in ophthalmology. All three of the authors declare an interest in the laser that will be discussed here. In all cataract surgery, the perfect capsulotomy should be of the correct size to get 360 degree IOL coverage, of the correct shape, circular, to get symmetrical capsular contraction in the correct place to place the IOL optic on the visual axis and with a strong elastic edge to avoid tearing during surgical maneuvers. Is there a technology used in adult eyes which might help in achieving this in pediatric eyes? There is selective laser capsulotomy using a laser. SLC requires the anterior capsule to be stained with a microfiltered solution of tripen blue 0.4%. This acts as a target for the laser beam to be absorbed and thus create, using a low temperature continuous thermal beam, a circular capsulotomy. The laser has converted the type 4 collagen of the capsule. You can see mounted on microscope on the left. There's a console which fits onto a tray beside the microscope, and this sets the size of the capsule onto between 4.5 and 5.5 millimeters, and there's a foot switch to make it all happen. Now let's prepare the eye for the laser. First thing we're going to do is inject the microfiltered tripan blue. This has a greater specific gravity than aqueous, which means it sinks to the bottom onto the surface of the capsule. It's normally left there for about 30 seconds and then is thoroughly washed out using BSS. 
Once this has been done, you see this going on now, we will inject some 2% sodium hyronate. This is to fully fill the chamber. It's important to make sure that the anterior chamber is over deepened and the surface of the capsule is as flat as possible. You can tell this by getting some extra OVD coming out of the wound. Now turn on the laser. And once we've done that, you can start to center the beam. And once the beam is centered, then the foot pedal will be depressed. And in less than a third of a second, the capsulotomy will be created. I'm ready to fire now. And there we've got our capsulotomy. Interesting with this white cataract, there's no uh, movement forward of any of the soft lens matter. The surface doesn't get disturbed until you actually take out the uh, capsulotomy cap underneath the OVD. The lens has now been implanted after the cataract removed and you'll see that there's good 360 degree coverage. That's not a misconstruction, it's not obvious because there are a number of different axes. There's the pupillary axis, center of the pupil. There's the optical axis, which goes through the center of the eye. And then there is the visual axis, which ends up on the fovea. Deviations from this will be either angle kappa or angle alpha. So how are we going to consider capsule optimist centration? Because it's a non-trivial issue due to the asymmetric 3D optical nature of the eyes I've just discussed. There's also the possibility of intraoptive patient tilt, asymmetric madrasis, and resultant resting location of the IOL. This is further exacerbated in hyperopic eyes, as we know, because these patients have a large angle cap on. The mesopic pupil will center not on the visual axis, because there may be displacement. This can be nasally as much as 0.3 millimeters, inferiorly 0.1 millimeters, or the worst case scenario is 0.6 millimeters. In a hyperopic eye, this can make quite a difference. The important thing to remember is that the eye will, if it's biospheric, has relatively little tolerance for decentration of the IOL from the vision axis. Here's an example of pupil centration, which is obviously not on the visual axis because you can see the Perkinje images here. So if it's not the limbus or the pupil, which are the landmarks, which one will yield better centration? As noted on a previous slide, there appears to be enhanced staining in the center of the capsule, which we call the tripan blue capsular landmark. And it is coaxial with the Perkinje image. The coaxial Perkinje image is well accepted for corneal refractive surgeries, the visual axis. But is this also true for IOL centration? An intense tripan blue stain, centrally located on anterior capsule, is present in over 95% of eyes. And it tends to be of a size approximately two to four millimeters. This feature had been found, but not discussed in previous studies using the femtosecond laser with stained capsular caps. A recent study has been undertaken to look at the importance of this landmark in relation to capsulotomy centration and the Perkin J image. There were 117 eyes in the study. The first 28 were used for induced pupil centration. The other 89, the centration was done using the capsular landmark. 95% of these eyes, in fact, had a good landmark present, and this was coincident with the third Perkin J image, with a displacement of less than 0.1 millimeters. And likewise, the coaxial Perkin J image and IOL centration were also coincident with 0.1 millimeters. The midriatic pupil centered capsulotomies were noticeably decentered from the IOLs by 0.3 millimeters. This compared with these group two. The ITC-centered capsulotomies 
where the displacement was 0.15 millimeters. And this was significant value of 0.05. So the benefit of the landmark being located on the anterior capsule includes sensitivity to tilt and also confirms patient fixation, serving as an alternative to the Perkins image. Here we can see some examples of the correlation between the TBCL and the coaxial Perkinje images. In other words, the visual axis. If we look at the control arm, in other words, centered on the pupil, we can see that there is a range of decentration up to 0.5 millimeters. The Perkinje image and IO position with TBCL centration shows a very different picture with very good correlation between these two ways of looking at centration. Here are some further thoughts about the study. Not only was capsulotomy centration on the Perkins image and TBCL superior to pupil centration, we also made some interesting observations, is that the resultant IR position appears centered on the visual axis, which implies the capsulotomy bag is centered on the visual, not the optical axis. And therefore, the TBC landmark is associated with the anatomy of the capsule bag. Hence, both are centered on the visual axis. So how will SLC work for a pediatric cataract? With the patient under general anesthetic, there'll be no further movements required as there might be if you're using a femtosecond laser. The steps of the technique fit into the normal surgical routine. The capsulotomy size can be chosen and created accurately. It will be circular with a strong edge. And by using the tripan blue capsule landmark, accurate centration can be achieved with ease. And this will mean IOL placement on the visual axis. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, I, that, was, that was absolutely amazing. We, we're going to uh, go straight on to uh, Namrata Sharma, and then we'll have a discussion uh, of your uh, amazing uh, talk, uh, Richard. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ken, for making me a part of this. And thank you, Dr. Uh, Granite, for uh, making me a part of this WSPS webinar. I would be talking to you about corneal collagen cross-linking in children. Uh, it is important. Uh, pediatric keratoconus is a, a different ball game completely because it may be associated with comorbidities such as VKC. There may be accelerated progression as compared to adults. And significantly, it is more severe at, uh, at the time of diagnosis. So 28% according to one study in stage four versus 7% in cases of adults. And it does affect the quality of life in children and adolescents. There are other management challenges as well because of, of the scarcity of functional complaints in children because they have high accommodative power, which may compensate for the distortions. Then corneal changes and visual impairment can lead to amblyopia and they are less compliant with the heart contact lens fitting, and in the event if you have to undergo a corneal transplantation, chances of rejections are also higher. The ophthalmoscopic signs are more frequent in children, 42% versus 29.5%. Asymmetry of keratoconus is significantly more, and cones are more, more likely to be centrally located in the pediatric patients. Uh, basically, collagen cross-linking, like in adults, uh, the mechanism remains the same. Riboflavin excitation with photoactivation is done with the UVA light, which uh, causes the release of the reactive oxygen species, formation of the new covalent bonds between the collagen molecules so that there's increased biomechanical resistance of the cornea. The indications, although it is said that it is, uh, it should be done when keratoconus is there with documented progression, but at our center now, we just do it at the time of presentation because we know that children progress very fast. Uh, having said this, the progression is generally defined as change in keratometry by more than one diopter over one year, uh, astigmatism more than 0.5 diopter, and thinnest pachymetry more than 20% over a year. Contraindications are essentially the same with corneal thickness less than 350 microns, severe con central uh, scarring, dry eye, immunocompromised uh, children, collagen vascular disease, poor wound healing, and riboflavin allergy. Now, these are the protocols which have been described for adults, and these have been extrapolated to children. So conventional collagen cross-linking with 30 minutes of riboflavin and 30 minutes radiation has proven efficacy in most studies. Accelerated collagen cross-linking where you have 20 minutes of riboflavin with 
uh, uh, UV radiation, which could span from five minutes to 10 minutes, depending on the energy used, uh, does offer less surgical time and compliance is better, especially in cases of children. And you have the trans epithelial collagen crosslinking with the epithelium on, uh, it is less efficacious. The duration is same as conventional crosslinking, and children postoperatively are more comfortable with it. Now, this is an important meta analysis of three collagen crosslinking protocols of 28 studies of 1300 uh, eyes, uh, which showed that in the pediatric age group, group, conventional and accelerated epithelium off techniques uh, showed significant improvement in the uncorrected visual acuity and the corrected distance visual acuity. The kerat keratometric indices also improved. But in cases of transepithelial uh, collagen crosslinking, the uncorrected visual acuity was not significantly altered. Uh, this is just to show uh, the table from the same, uh, which again corroborates the same thing. And although the UCDVA was the one which slightly improved, but all the other parameters remain unchanged. Again, this is an important study of seven year follow up in treated versus uh, non treated fellow eyes in uh, children again. And again, the mean keratometry showed significant flattening, the uncorrected and the best corrected visual acuity showed improvement. The corneal thickness as expected showed mild reduction. And uh, there were important thing to note is that there were eight untreated eyes. That means 26.6% cases which deteriorated and underwent collagen crosslinking while only one treated eye which required an additional crosslinking. So they concluded that fellow eye should be monitored uh, in all cases of uh, pediatric keratoconus and 25% will require collagen crosslinking in the fellow eye during the seven year follow-up. Uh, this is the study that we published on pediatric keratoconus and uh, the patients, the pediatric eyes underwent collagen crosslinking. This was a study of 116 eyes uh, under general or topical anesthesia, depending upon the age of the child. And we did accelerated collagen crosslinking for all the children, uh, our post-op regime consisted of topical antibiotics for a week, lubricants for three months, bandage contact lens was removed after epithelization uh, occurred, and topical uh, fluoromethylone was started after complete epithelization had happened, which was then gradually uh, tapered. And we had a follow-up of uh, 12 months. Now, of course, this cohort has completed almost two years. Uh, males were more in this cohort and there were more cases of uh, severe keratoconus or moderate to severe keratoconus in stage three and stage four, and most cases were bilateral. Important thing is that we also had eyes in this who had acute high drops and there were at least four eyes within presentation of acute high drops within three months, they had, uh, uh, they, uh, they had to be uh, cross-linked because the fellow eyes had acute high drops. So whenever you have a case of pediatric keratoconus, I think it is very important that you immediately cross-link the fellow eye as well. Of course, uh, vernal keratoconjunctivitis was present in 58% uh, of our cohort. Again, uh, it is important because allergic keratoconjunctivitis can lead to uh, corneal ectasia followed by paracentral thinning. And uh, these were again moderate to severe cases with the K max of 60K and pechymetry, which was uh, uh, thinnest pechymetry being 396 uh, microns. Uh, again, uh, we looked at hysteresis, we looked at aberometry in these cases, and even the confocal microscopy in these cases. And uh, what we basically found was that collagen cross-linking did help in terms of visual outcomes and refractive outcomes at the end of one year. And the topography was also uh, stabilized in these cases, which was found to be significant. Pachymetry, as expected, was uh, low, but was not statistically significant. And aberrometry did become better in all these cases, which was, again, significant. We did have sterile infiltrates, mild corneal haze, and a case of infectious keratitis as well. Now, uh, again, to talk about the corneal biomechanics, we did not use pentachem, but we uh, used, uh, we studied corneal hysteresis and corneal resistance factor in these cases, and we did not find any difference at the end of one year, and there was no difference in confocal microscopy also as far as the uh, qualitative parameters, quantitative parameters were concerned. The progression correlated positively with the presence of VKC and higher order abrasions and negatively with the thinnest pachymetry. So uh, 
this is uh, just to show that in our experience, we did find that the progression is halted in 80% of the eyes with improved parameters. And these are just cases to show how in one case, it has uh, stabilized at six months post-crosslinking. Uh, post in another case, it is 54.5, but increased by 1.6 diopter despite cross-linking. And we've, when we compared our VKC versus non-VKC eyes, we found that the results were quite comparable and were found to be similar, although sterile infiltrates as expected for more with the VKC group. I could only find one study where intracorneal uh, syring segments were combined in children for cross-linking uh, in cases of uh, VKC. And to conclude, uh, as has been summarized, as has been talked in the presentation also, in children, it tends to be, uh, keratoconus tends to be more advanced, it progresses faster, you require a frequent follow-up. I would advocate collagen cross-linking at presentation. Accelerated cross-linking is efficacious. There may be progression despite cross-linking. Eye rubbing should be discouraged and there could be sterile infiltrates in VKC eyes. The future insights are that all the protocols have been developed for adolescent eyes, none for uh, pediatric eyes. Uh, these need to be standardized because the biomechanics, healing response, immunological aspects, all are different uh, in keratoconic corneas in children. You require lifetime results, although we have long-term results now uh, to five to seven years, and redos how, what time, and how many times is something, again, which has to be looked at. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much. I mean, I, that, those two last talks, again, uh, have completely uh, uh, blown me out of the water. I'm going to ask a couple of questions to Namrata and Richard, and then David, perhaps we can open it up and uh, start asking questions about all the talks. So Namrata, what do you prefer? Do you prefer epithelium off in children uh, with the Dresden protocol, or do you prefer accelerated or transepithelial? So we uh, do epithelium off with the accelerated collagen cross linking protocol. Okay, and do you do that awake or under general anesthetic? So it depends on the uh, age of the child. If the child is cooperative, and I've seen that even a nine year old, you know, can be cooperative to get it done under topical. But if the child is not cooperative, then we do it under general anesthesia. Great, great. Uh, Richard, I wanted to ask you, I, I have never heard of the term tripan blue, did you call it TBCL, that central um, lay, um, zone? Yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, we didn't realize the significance of that. We've been staining these capsules for some years now uh, to use the laser. And then there was a blinding flash. We realized that this is actually rather significant because you can line it up with the Perkins images and it absolutely nails the visual axis. So this what, means- why, why did it stain like that? What, what, what is the- I don't know. Uh, I don't know. We're, we're looking at the, the histology at the moment. As I said, um, if you looked at the, uh, the slide that showed those discs that came from the Femto study, it, it, it really is there. And it's, uh, it's remarkable. And once you see it, you think, well, why didn't we notice that before? It's always the way, isn't it? Um, so let me ask, has anybody else ever noticed this central staining area with type of tripen blue? Because now that uh, Richard talked to me about this yesterday, and I've looked through some old videos of mine, and it's there, but I just never had noticed it before. I just sort of was so busy trying to do the capsular axis. Anybody else on the panel notice this? I think I, I would agree with uh, Richard and you completely. Uh, that uh, uh, we didn't pay attention to it. It's like that. And then when you start looking for it, then you actually start seeing it. Fascinating, fascinating. David, do you, uh, th there's so many oh, questions. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have a whole host of them, so I'm gonna fire away quick. Um, Namrata, you, if I heard you correctly, you said that you would do corneal cross-linking at presentation. Yes. So uh, it, 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 next week, I'm sorry, in children, right? right. In children. Next week, next week, all the pediatric ophthalmologists around the world that are seeing children are going to have a child come in whose father or mother has keratoconus and they note some mild changes and they see that they think the child may have keratoconus. Should we be referring them to you for cross-linking immediately? No, I wouldn't say that. Of course, you have to see the severity of the keratoconus. But like I said, the cohort that we get are moderate to severe keratoconus. If it's a mild keratoconus, then I would still, you know, 
uh, I would still uh, keep that child on a on a on a follow up, but would follow up frequently. I wouldn't follow up the child after every one year, but I would follow up the child at three months interval, and uh, documentation of progression would be required for a case which is mild, but for a case which is moderate or for a case which is severe, eight year old, nine year old, I have seen that they come for you do cross linking in one eye. And if you don't do cross linking in the other eye, then you know, they would land up say within the next six months or one year with the acute high drops, and then they'll come to you with that. So I we have at least four such cases, uh, you know, like that. So I would say that for cases which are mild, you should, you should document progression, but for cases which are moderate and severe, I think there is no point waiting. It is, you know, better to cross-link them uh, earlier rather than later. I think Ike has a question for Richard. I think Ike has a question for Richard. Richard, thanks so much for that really informative talk. I mean, it's been an amazing cast here. A um, couple questions, you know, we know that with automated capsulotomy techniques that the eventual final size is related to the elasticity of the capsule. And of course, our pediatric patients have very elastic capsules. So how do we adequately determine the right size? Because of course, on an adult, it'll be different than a pediatric eye. And my next question would be more related to PCCs. Uh, any experience using uh, this technology for posterior Yeah, we, we've done the, the PCCs in pig eyes and in cadaver eyes in the lab. We're finding some difficulty at the moment with the posterior capsule staining with, uh, with tripan blue. And we're working out how best to, uh, to do that. As far as the elasticity issues is concerned, because of the way that this laser works, it's actually annealing the edge. So we don't see, even in younger patients that have, that have been done with this, we don't see that stretching effect. But I mean, what we'll need to do is, is to start using this in pediatric eyes. And if you do find that, that they do stretch, then you just aim for a smaller capsulotomy and you end up with a bigger one. A, a bit the way you do when you're doing a manual capsulotomy in a, a, a pediatric eye. You're, you're um, pulling much more towards the center than you would with an adult because you're allowing for that elasticity. And if you allow the elasticity to take over, you end up with a much larger capsulotomy than you intended. So yes, I mean, I, I think that's right. But because of the way this, uh, this laser is working, it's actually having a, uh, a very localized thermal effect as it goes round. It's creating a very elastic edge, but it's also doing it so quickly that it doesn't actually have time to expand significantly. And we've seen this now with um, intumescent cataracts where there is pressure in the, in the capsular bag that there is no extension outwards. I've done a talk uh, which has got the, the accumulated uh, white cataracts that have been done with capsule laser and there has been no deviation in this regard. And I would imagine it will be fairly similar when we do this on, on pediatric uh, capsules as well. So, um, uh, David, I'm going to just uh, uh, throw this back to our earlier speakers. A couple of questions for you, uh, Shiguru. Uh, any role for omega-3 supplements or multivitamins in dry eye in children? I, I think I, I, I'm not so sure, at least uh, for, the, uh, for the adults, uh, there's some of the reports on supplementation is effective or not effective, and in, even in a new and general medicine, I think uh, 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 somebody, uh, I think I wrote that, but I'm not so sure. And actually, I think you should not, for the kids, I think I should not, uh, probably I, I've not used the supplementation. Anyone dry on the panel eye. using any supplements That's for dry eye? children not in children i think we've not used in children and adults yes we have used it but not in children can can what um, about for my bovine gland disease do you, or for uh, other lid disease do you use any supplements yeah i use flaxseed oil uh but i prefer to use the oil rather than any of the gummy bears there's too much sugar in the gummy bears but uh i, I would say that it it appears to be helpful but i haven't really got enough evidence. I haven't really uh, done a sort of a prospective study and it's something that I, I intend to do with the couple of new uh, appointments that we've made recently. Um, Great. Gonna... Let me let me jump in, Ken. I wanted to ask Andy a question. Andy, we heard about intraocular lens implants. We heard about capsulotomies and capsular excess. There have been astronauts sent into space with an IOL, right? Yes. And, and what, what do we have to look for as we all get older and have IOLs and travel into space with you uh, as we go to Mars? I haven't seen any problems. We actually had a flyer with glaucoma, I believe it or not. 
no no problems with the flight. So having glaucoma is not a contraindication to flying. Well, you wonder and the, what the reason is sometimes the flyer is needed not for their flying skills, but for their scientific skills. So there's been a total shift in the astronaut corps away from test pilots and super high-end physical specimens towards like nerd people like us. And the nerd people are actually the astronauts now. So revenge of the nerds, all you jocks, revenge of the nerds. <laughs> for our listeners, it's been so engaging. We're going to run over five minutes. So uh, hang on with us if you can. Um, question to Ike. Ike, what is your favorite initial procedure for congenital glaucoma? Well, again, it's angle-based trabeculotomy procedures depending on the view. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, my preference is to do circumferential trabeculotomy, uh, yeah. typically using a microcatheter-assisted approach. Would you um, ever consider that's... a stent? Would you ever consider a stent as a primary procedure instead of a trabeculectomy in a child, if you had to do that? Well, I mean, it depends what the stent is. I, again, I, I, would, I would, you know, certainly look to doing a micro shunt in the subcon space before a bleb. Yes, I think that's where I'm at today. But again, going back to the angle though, I think we're typically going cutting approaches. And if we're using a stent in the angle, like eye stent or hydrus, we're combining it with a goniotomy or trabeculotomy with the stent. I don't think the stent, at least in my experience, is gonna be enough in these eyes and doesn't Great. address the underlying so mechanism either. And I want to throw this in that topic, a question to both you and Ike, which is in, in congenital cataracts, there's a very high incidence of long-term glaucoma. Should we be like you do with some adults, be doing cataract surgery and glaucoma surgery at the same time and placing any of these micro stents or doing anything else? Yeah, it's a good question, David. I mean, I think in the absence of elevated pressure or glaucoma, I'd be reluctant to do that. Um, I don't think there's really any necessarily rationale. And we don't know, of course, the impact yet in these young eyes. So my preference would be to deal with it as it happens after. Although, of course, it does, it does happen, unfortunately, quite commonly and address it then. And I still, again, go back to the angle with my preferred approach, as I mentioned. So, of course, if somebody has an elevated pressure at the time, then we address it. And I would address it as well by the different mechanisms we spoke about. I, I agree. I agree. I, I, I have a, uh, David, I have a question. Well, actually, it's a statement uh, for, for Andy. Andy, this is from Warren Hindle again. He says, because there's no gravity, the effect should be from the juxtaposition of periocular structures and would likely have persistence mainly during sleep. Any comments on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it would persist. It persists all the time, so... Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if the physiology of the sleep is actually changing it, but of course at nocturnal hypotension, the intraocular pressure is changing. So there's a clear rationale for things happening when you're sleeping, whether you're sleeping in zero G or full G, but I don't think it's a positional thing. It's, uh, it's pressure, all, all those things that happen on earth that you can't make stop once you get into space. Um, I, we're, we're beginning to run out of time. So I'm going to ask David, should we ask all the panelists to give us one pearl each as we uh, close down? And then I'll, I'll give the final slides while everybody's doing that. I, I would like to ask the panelists to give 10 pearls each, but we'll have to take one for the moment. <laughs> let's, let's, kick off, let's kick off with uh, Ike. Well, I think we're cautiously optimistic that the application of novel glaucoma procedures will move toward our pediatric and important populations. Uh, the use of microcatheters of assisted trabeculotomies, possible stenting may also be used adjunctively. And certainly with blood-based procedures, I believe the future is to move away from trabs and tubes as primary blood procedures in these populations and move toward micro shunting approaches which I believe will lead to safer uh, filtering procedures, allowing us to use more mitomycin and addressing things in a less invasive way. And I think that's where I hope and see things going now and in the future. Fantastic. Is Shigeru? Yes, I think yeah, when you see that some of the ocular surface abnormalities in children, please look at the uh, eyelid margin, especially the upper eyelid margin. So that's a key for that. Andy? It's deeply ingrained in the human spirit to want to explore. This is why you became an ophthalmologist. This is why you became a neuro-ophthalmologist or a cornea specialist. No matter what you have chosen, if you're on this call, you have intellectual curiosity. And exploring space is for mankind, not for one man, not for one country, for the benefit of all men. 
Is that on behalf of the United States government? <laughs> that is not on behalf of the United States government. <laughs> Namrata? So I think, uh, like I emphasized earlier, follow-up for pediatric keratoconus is extremely important, uh, which should be done at frequent intervals. And I do believe that protocols for pediatric keratoconus, especially the protocols for collagen cross-linking, they need to be standardized further because these have been made for adolescents and for adults, but not for pediatric eyes. And redos are something that we really have to look at because there are going to be a lot more frequent redos in children as compared to in adults. So there are, I mean, pediatric keratoconus collagen cross-linking is a completely uncharted, you know, territory, which really needs to be uh, developed further. Richard, thank you, Ranta. Richard? I think what I've learned is that it's not a question of what you look at, it's a question of what you see. And then you have to, have to ask yourself, when you've seen it, what does it actually mean? Because we've all seen, as I showed you, this, uh, this uh, staining effect, but until somebody points it out to you, or you notice it, you never notice what the importance of it is. And there's sort of so many things that we will come across in our practice that we need to look at in a, uh, a more, uh, should we say, uh, adaptive way. Thank you very much. That's, a, that's another uh, uh, thing to remember that you've taught me and taught the rest of us. Everybody, thank you so much. Uh, if you want audience uh, attendance participation certificates, please email program at wspos.org. Um, uh, there are some upcoming webinars we've talked about. Please try and join us on the 19th of June, 26th of June, 3rd of July. And we have a couple of others coming in July as well. Um, WSPOS Connect 2, our second virtual meeting will be 25th and 26th of September. We'll be, we'll be reaching out to you uh, for abstracts, etc. cetera. Um, I don't know what to say. David, do you, I don't know what to say about the people on this, the panel today, the speakers. I am blown away. You, you, you normally I, think calling, I think calling them rock stars was understating it. Um, this was an incredible group. Um, and uh, there was an old saying that I used to hear from Casey Kasem when he finished his top 40 radio show. And he said, uh, keep your feet on the ground and reach for the stars. And I think that uh, given what Andy talked about and that this panel who's constantly reaching for new answers to old problems and to vexing problems, um, it, it's inspiring. It is why we became ophthalmologists, Andy, and it is that curiosity that will continue to drive humankind forward. So I thank all of you for, for all the work that you've done, all the patients and children that you've helped. They can't always say thank you. So on behalf of all of them, Ken and I get to say thank you so much for all that you do. Thank you, really thank you. And I just want to thank Todd, our supporters uh, for the uh, webinar, uh, our the admin team, Akila, Maria, Dara, Camilla, um, and uh, this is a killer playing her sitar. Thank you very much, wherever you are in the world, together apart, WSPOS. This has been one of the most amazing webinars I've ever had the privilege to moderate. Thank you, each and every one of you. Uh, hear from you soon. Tell all your friends about this webinar. It's going to be on the YouTube channel for WSPOS. Um, thanks very much, everybody, and uh, goodbye. As I say, Thank goodbye you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>